Kids Radio Broadcast. On the Newsmaker Line, we have with us again this evening, Craig Wynn. Craig, welcome to the program. Hi, Daniel. My pleasure to be back with you. Well, uh, it's great to have you back on, and uh, we never seem to have enough time with you on the two-hour period that we have you on. And uh, I told people last week, when Craig comes on, they better be listening very hard because you, you, you put the facts out at a rapid pace. We sure try to uh, uh, awaken people to the... the uh, the reality that much of what we have been told, both by politicians and our media, even what we're uh, we're uh, taught in school, is uh, not only wrong, but it's it's so wrong that it makes us uh, incredibly vulnerable. In what way? Well, we're uh, we're extremely vulnerable to the primary threat uh, in the world today, which is uh, fundamentalist Islam, and our politicians and our media routinely deceive us. Uh, about uh, Islam calling it the war on terror, which is a tactic. You can't have a war on a tactic. Calling it uh, insurgents who are uh, rising up and uh, and killing us when that is nonsense. Insurgents is someone who rebels against authority when, in fact, the people who are killing us are uh, submitting to the to what they consider to be the ultimate authority, which is uh, Allah uh, and uh, and Islam. Uh, and while a nation deceives itself about the enemy that is attacking it, that uh, nation makes itself more vulnerable every day. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, our whole, every moment we have spent in Iraq has uh, has uh, made America more vulnerable, and and uh, we will pay a, a hellacious price for uh, uh, for the deception of our politicians and uh, and our media, and that uh, ultimately hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans are going to die. Okay, well, uh, how do we, uh, you know, you've been on before and we've talked about uh, the, the meaning of uh, uh, Yahweh and things like that, and you, you definitely uh, lit up the airwaves talking about uh, the uh, the origins of Islam. Uh, but it seems that, uh, and tonight uh, we have you uh, scheduled, as we kind of made arrangements with you last time, about the uh, uh, the, the uh, seven days in Genesis. But So you, you've, you've kind of gone from the, the war and the and exposing of the true meaning of Islam and that. Did that trigger your interest to find out, well, if that's all messed up, I'm going to go right back to the beginning and start there? Well, these things are related. When I began to try to... Uh to explain, and in t- the first book I wrote about uh, Islam was called Tea with Terrorists. It was about the meeting that I actually had with with Al Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and Oscar Martyrs Brigade, and I was asking them why they were killing us, and and their answers to those questions uh, and my meetings with them became the basis of the book uh, Tea with Terrorists. And in that book, I made an attempt to lay out a three-part plan that America could have implemented and prevailed in, uh, against Islamic uh, terrorism. Now, we as a nation have done exactly the opposite, so we are, we are losing the war. But in that plan, step one is uh, directly related to what you have just said. Uh, we are so deceived as a nation in terms of who God is, what he wants, uh, and what he has actually revealed, that we've lost our moral compass. Um, we've lost the ability as a nation to understand right from wrong. And when you're in that position, then there is nothing that you can do to defend yourself. Uh, a great example is that the Christian right in America re-elected George W. Bush, and yet George W. Bush is probably the most lethal man to occupy the White House in a very, very long time. Uh, a man who says that Allah, the God of Islam, who is modeled after Satan, is the same as the God of the Bible, whom I'm not even sure if he knows his name, but his name is Yahweh. They are absolute opposites. And yet this man says that they're the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because we don't know what Scripture actually says, uh, we as a nation can be fooled so badly that people who call themselves Christians and evangelicals will jump up and down with glee for having uh, re-elected to this man that has deceived the nation about something this serious. Mm. Well, you we, we talk about George Bush being the most most uh, lethal person that we've ever had. Uh, you know, it, it does seem that there's a whole lot of uh, major denomination denomination leaders uh, like CNN, TBN, these types of things that are uh, running to back him up to say he he's bringing back uh, uh, the the Christian way, so to speak, back to the country. Yeah, Do you see, disagree that's, with yeah, that? That's the whole problem with uh, with being deceived as a nation. We we think that the man who is lying to us. Uh, who is making the country uh, considerably more uh, vulnerable uh, is uh, is the man who is uh, who is the believer who is telling us the truth and you know I, just nothing could be further from the uh, the truth. A man who was part of Skull and Bones and won't deny it 
uh, cannot be a Christian. There, are, there is a zero intersection between those who will be saved and, and spend eternity in, uh, with God in heaven uh, and those who are, uh, are members of Skull and Bones. It is just an absolute impossibility. One is a, a, an illuminist organization that, uh, that is based on a reverence for, uh, for Satan. Uh, and so uh, how in the world, what, what is it that, that has caused the Christian right to be so deceived in terms of, uh, of what Yahweh is like and what he dislikes to uh, to uh, hey, Craig, fill me, the airways with such nonsense. Okay, well let me let me try something on you. We had a guest here a few weeks ago uh, named uh, Stephen Schroeder, and he has uh, exposed the uh, absolute connection between the U.S. government and uh, the the uh, uh, the infusion of paganism in with our, our, our buildings and our, our laws. Oh, you're talking about Washington D.C. being correct. founded on uh, on on Freemason uh, re as opposed to correct. Christianity. Yeah, correct. Yeah, well, yeah, he's he's absolutely correct. Yeah, and all of, every one of America's leaders was either a Freemason, the highest ranking Freemason in America mm -hmm. at the time of the country's founding was Benjamin Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. uh, the second highest was George Washington. Every person that George Washington. Uh, elevated to positions of power, including every general in the Revolutionary War, was a Freemason, uh, and George Washington was intimately aware of the uh, of uh, of Adam Weishaupt's uh, mm -hmm. uh, infiltration of Freemasonry and really co-opting yeah. Freemasonry worldwide for the purpose mm -hmm. of the uh, Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati may sound conspiratorial for most listeners, but uh, Adam Weishaupt, who was the founder of the Illuminati, uh, was the creator of communism and the uh, and the and what we call the new world order. Uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson, well, uh, uh, not high up in terms of Freemasonry, uh, was a deist, as was Adam Weishaupt, and the the primary place where where this communist new world order uh, illuminist doctrine grew initially was in France with the uh, the Jacobins yeah. uh, who uh, who led the uh, the bloody revolution known as the French Revolution mm -hmm. and uh, Thomas Jefferson was deeply steeped in that in fact Thomas Jefferson when when someone uh, condemned Adam Weishaupt for being uh, uh, both deist and and, uh, and Satanist uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson said no I think Adam Weishaupt mm -hmm. is one of the most noble men who ever lived yeah well, well to finish the, the point uh, he said because you you asked you were sort of out loud wondering how that could how could people be so blind and, and what uh, Stephen Schroeder said was that when you mix the profane with the holy then a spell is created well that's that's that is absolutely true uh, and it, of course the 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 corruption I I embedded in Freemasonry. Uh, was the drimey force for the creation of of, uh, of much of the the documents of America as well as the capital itself? The cap U.S. Capitol is laid out absolutely using Freemason symbols, including the the upside down um, uh, five pointed star, which is the primary uh, uh, satanic symbol. George Washington's uh, uh, monument uh, is uh, is an obelisk, which is a uh, the sun ray uh, inside of a circle. But Satan. For all of recorded time, starting with the first religion, um, which was the Babylonian religion called uh, the Whore of Babylon in, uh, in Scripture, recognized that if you're going to deceive people, uh, you can never deceive them with an outright lie. If you're going to be successful in beguiling people, what you have to do is you have to base your lie upon truth. And then what you do is you, with your lie... Uh, scripture calls this whitewashing, by the way. It's plastering mm -hmm. over and whitewashing, where you where you place your lie right on top of the truth. And when you do that, not only do you uh, you deceive people, but you also hide the truth underneath your lie. Uh, the Catholic Church is probably the best example of this in uh, in America. Almost every key aspect of Catholicism is based upon the Babylonian religion. Well, Craig, does the corruption of of that particular religion strain of Christianity, I suppose? Does it, is, is it really from the depths of hell? I mean, isn't it just people just, just saying, you know, they want to do their rites or rituals? Is there a reality to their, to whatever, whatever they're doing? No, it's, uh, it is, Catholicism is based on uh, the Babylonian uh, sun god religion. Uh, its founder, Constantine, was a, uh, was a devil worshiper. When he looked up at the, uh, at the sun and saw the image of a cross in front of it, 
Uh, the word cross does not appear, by the way, anywhere in Scripture. Not, not of course, in English, but but even the uh, the Greek word for it uh, does not uh, appear as an upright pole mm-hmm. because the cross is uh, was Satan's primary uh, symbol. Now you re- you realize I can I can literally, literally watch the log offs uh, <laughs> to the show when you when you say something about the cross, you know. Well, the fact of the matter is, the cross is a satanic symbol. The Whoa. word cross uh, I, I was added to uh, to the Latin version of uh, of the Vulgate, uh, which is a translation, of course, of the uh, of the Greek, uh, in about the seventh century. Um, uh, stros, which is the Greek word, means upright pole, and upright pole is an essential element in understanding Scripture, because throughout Scripture, uh, I. Uh, Yeshua, uh, who is the real name of who we call Jesus, uh, errantly, mm-hmm. um, Yeshua was the upright one, and the word that that is in Hebrew translated Adonai is actually not mm-hmm. written in the Hebrew scripture, it's mm-hmm. Edon, yeah. and Edon is the foundation of the uh, the upright one. And when you, when you use cross and you don't un- understand the upright pole and what it represents, you lose the whole connection between the uh, the old and the new covenant. It's a terrible mm-hmm. thing to do, and you're mm-hmm. in essence with the uh, the cross. You're you're uh, not only missing the whole connection with the old covenant, but you're replacing the uh, you're you're using what is is primarily a satanic symbol. Yeah, and it sounds like if somebody the, the challenge to what you just said is uh, I would say the the in depth scholarly response of Oh, I don't believe that. I, well, think, I think that's the typical response, yeah, well, the, the scholarly response you'll get. Yeah, well, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, that Strauss is the uh, is the Greek word. The, that word uh, means uh, upright pole, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it is based on a root, hestemi, which means the one who stands upright, enabling others to stand upright. The, the principal nature of redemption, which is the, is what is, Prophesized in the old covenant and fulfilled in the uh, in the new covenant is a very specific form of salvation that is based upon the Savior literally ransoming uh, humankind, and uh, and that is enables us to be what's called vindicated, which is to be right before God, and so it is the upright one who makes us right, so we can stand uh, uh, with God. And that's even an interesting concept. Most Christians are on this belief that God wants to be worshipped, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. There, there is no word uh, related to worship uh, within uh, his family. The, any time any one of, uh, of, of his children falls down in a worshipful mode, the first thing uh, Yahweh says, hey, stand up. If you want to talk to me, you've got to stand up. And his first description of the relationship he wanted to establish with with mankind, it's with uh, Abraham, and he told Abraham four things, and they are, uh, walk with me, don't walk behind me, don't get on your knees and crawl around me, walk with me, uh, be conversant with me, um, you know, talk to me, let's have a conversation, be at ease with me, and be straight with me. Those, those four things, and those are the four things... Are you saying God knows when we're uh, lying? Uh, yes, he does, <laughs> and he does not like this idea that I'm mm. I'm going to somehow please God by going mm. to uh, to uh, a worship service on Sunday. As a matter of fact, mm. he hates anything related to uh, to uh, worship, but he particularly hates uh, us doing it on Sunday. That's it's one of the great deceptions of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church knows for certain, and they they say within their own catechisms and their own documents that there is no justification whatsoever for Sunday worship uh, in Scripture. As a matter of fact. Sunday is the worship of the mm-hmm. sun god. Catholicism was built upon the Babylonian well, well, sun god. Well, well, Craig, Craig, hasn't this country worked rather well with this Sunday business for for hundreds of years? Uh, it serves uh, serves men very well. Yes, they've built very fine, very elaborate uh, religious institutions with very expensive churches and lots of very fine salaries going to lots of uh, of uh, clerics. It works beautifully for the uh, the religious community. Uh, Yahweh has a very clear message about uh, about it, both positive and negative. The positive is remember the uh, the Sabbath and keep it set apart. That is the day that you should not do ordinary work. Yeshua, who is the example, always went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. There is no justification whatsoever for uh, for Sunday services. Now, beyond all of that, you've got the issue that. There are very few things that Yahweh calls an abomination, 
but one of the things that he calls an abomination is following the heathen ways uh, of the Baal um, religion. The Baal religion, Baal means Lord and, uh, in Hebrew, and Baal as the sun god uh, is the thing that, that Yahweh uh, hates the most. And central to the worship of the sun god was to, uh, to worship on Sunday. Now, the devil wants to be worshipped. Yahweh does not. Second, it is the, uh, this whole nonsense of Easter. Easter was the primary holiday of the, of the sun god Baal. That's when Mother Earth was impregnated on the vernal equinox, always celebrated on a Sunday nearest the vernal equinox. Nine months later, on Christmas, is when the son of the sun is born. Uh, all of those are pagan holidays. Sunday, Christmas, Easter, not only pagan, mm-hmm. but purely satanic. Yahweh has uh, seven uh, mikra, seven uh, set-apart uh, assemblies that are required for man to, uh, to keep those appointments for all eternity. Mm-hmm. And not only by following the ways of the, uh, of the, the satanic religion of Babylon by worshiping on Sunday, mm-hmm. are we doing something wrong? And by celebrating Christmas and Easter, are we following what, what he calls an abomination? What we think of it as meaningless he calls it an abomination. He's God, so he, his vote counts. Ours doesn't. Mm-hmm. Craig, Craig, but we also forget the, the seven micra, and we forget the seven micra. We lose the whole concept of the integration between the Old and the New Covenants. Mm-hmm. Craig, I, I just got back from uh, the Smoky Mountains again. Uh, I, I get there quite often, I suppose. But I was in Cherokee, North Carolina, and you know, there's something called the Trail, Trail of Tears. I'm pretty sure you may have heard that. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happened was uh, uh, the, the white men wanted their land, and right. so they just kicked them off the land. Right. But to, to finish them off, uh, besides taking their, their land, and uh, to finish them off, they brought in uh, the, uh, the uh, say, the, the Christianizers and tried to Christianize them. And the thought occurred to me as I was in Cherokee that while well, they accused the Cherokee of worshiping pagan idols, they brought their own in and said, hey, no, those are the wrong idols. Worship our idols. Was I wrong in that conclusion? I know you're right in that conclusion. There's, there are... Yahweh only gave man two rights. Uh, and one of the things that he, he did not give man is the right to compel anyone else's uh, religion. Uh, as a matter of fact, Yahweh hates religion. He is anti-religious. And the idea of compelling someone to say, you will either accept our religion or we will either kill you or we will imprison you, is completely alien to, uh, to his scriptures. The two rights that he has actually given man have nothing to do with the uh, Declaration of Independence. They are the right to know and the right to choose. Those are the only two rights that we have as, uh, as human beings that are God-given rights. The right to know, the right to choose. The whole idea of compelling people as that, uh, uh, that uh, way of tears, the march of tears, the walk of tears would indicate, and, and the way that they, particularly the Roman Catholics, came to the, uh, the New World, uh, compelling people to accept their religion or die is the, uh, is the opposite of what God wants. That's Islam. Islam means submission. It's the whole concept of uh, you will either agree with, uh, with, uh, with me and, uh, and follow my rules or I'm going to have an inquisition and, and uh, accuse mm-hmm. you of being satanic and, uh, and kill you. Yeah. But is it, uh, in, a, in a broader sense, is it uh, God's will that, uh, say, for instance, going back to the, the Cherokee, how that they, um, they knew about the Great Spirit? I mean, there, here's, a, here's, a, here's a civilization that knew there was a Great Spirit out there that, that took care of them and whatnot. And it seemed like they, they were just missing the sun part. Uh, is it, in a general sense, on, on all different kinds of religions, wherever or, or religions or cultures where people are, is it that God would accept their culture, uh, but He wants them to accept their, His Son, or does He want to completely change the culture into one universal culture? And in this case here, the overpowering one is the Anglo-Saxon Christian culture. No. As I say, uh, Yahweh only wants two things: He wants uh, man to have the uh, to know and to be able to uh, to choose. That's the reason why there is a Great Commission. The Great Commission is not to, uh, to uh, impose a, uh, a religion. Uh, the Great Commission is to let people know about the, uh, the good news that, uh, that Yahweh be, took on human form and, uh, and ransomed us from our sins so that we could live forever with Him. We know for certain that uh, that is the singular way to, uh, to salvation. Uh, 
Uh, now, that in terms of what uh, Yahweh will expect of a Native American Indian that, that lived in this country before that simple truth of salvation was known is, uh, is up to him. Uh, it's his gift to give. He can apply that gift any way he wishes to. Uh, and, uh, and I am certain that he will be uh, fair and reasonable. But it is our job to, uh, to tell the world the truth. Now, the way the world works now, there would be very few people who would not have access to the uh, the truth of salvation as presented by uh, Yahweh in his uh, in his scripture and we know for certain that the that those who rely on that gift uh, will be born anew and live forever with him as for those who do not and have not heard the the uh, the good news uh, that's between uh, them and their maker uh, you and I are Mm-hmm. Don't get to play God and, and uh, determine what happens to them. Okay. All right, we have a question coming on the Edge Radio Broadcast website. Uh, what do you think about the movie The Passion of the Christ? Well, there are things I like about it and things I don't like about it. Um, uh, the, one of the things I really detest about it is the fact that a significant part of it uh, came from uh, the, uh, the the this uh, necromongering uh, woman who said that uh, she, uh, as a Catholic, she had this uh, revelation and, and that uh, she was given insights into what the Passion was like, and, and, uh, and that's part of the stirring of, uh, of all of this. Any insight that is received from, uh, from a dead spirit is an abomination to, uh, to Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, of Catholic women say that they get revelations from Mary. Mary is very, very, very dead. Mm-hmm. She cannot hear prayers. Yeah. To pray to Mary is an abomination, according to uh, to, uh, to Scripture. She cannot hear you. She is not an intermediary. And so part of it was based on that. Second, while it does have a scene at the end that is a resurrection scene, and that's a very good thing, and while it is important for us to know the level of suffering that Yeshua went through to, uh, to redeem us, the price he paid... Uh, you know, an, an hour and a half of uh, of uh, of beating a man up for five minutes of uh, of resurrection uh, has hmm. the story way out of kilter in terms of of what is uh, what is reasonable. I mean, if you look at at the totality of Scripture, uh, there are um, are two, actually three, pretty detailed accounts of the uh, of the crucifixion. Uh, in the Old Covenant, the best depiction of the crucifixion in Scripture is Psalm 22, uh, about the sacrifice that uh, Yeshua's soul made uh, in Sheol, uh, which is the place we call uh, hell, uh, uh, is depicted in Psalm 88. And the reason for it, the best presentation, if you will, of the gospel okay. message is in uh, Isaiah 53. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have uh, some fairly brief uh, depictions of the okay. uh, of the crucifixion. And if you take all of that and you put it in the context with the whole scriptural message, you've got one uh, percent uh, versus ninety nine percent, and the passion of the, of, uh, of the Christ is ninety nine percent. One percent. So I just All think right. it's 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 out of kilter. Okay. All right. Uh, simple question. Uh, are you uh, are you in the Zionism? Well, uh, Yahweh is a Zionist. Um, uh, all Zion is it's the uh, it's the uh, one of the mountains uh, in Jerusalem. The two most important mountains in Jerusalem are Moriah and uh, and Zion. Uh, and Yahweh uses Zion interchangeably with uh, Israel. Uh, Israel actually means uh, one who uh, who strives, endures, and is empowered by uh, by God. And he uses Zion interchangeably with uh, with Jerusalem and interchangeably with uh, Israel. And do people to, use to not be pro uh, Israel and not to be pro? Uh, uh, Jerusalem, one cannot be part of, mm-hmm. of Yahweh's family. Those things go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. So anyone who is part of Yahweh's family must absolutely be a, uh, a Zionist. If you are mm-hmm. not a Zionist, then you yeah. are kidding yourself in terms of thinking that uh, that you have a relationship well, don't, with don't, the living God. Don't, don't people use the word or the term Zionist as a derogatory term, though? Well, of course. Uh, the uh, For... 
you know, better part of uh, that four thousand for better part of four thousand years. Isn't that usually used to eliminate to stop the conversation? Well, yes, for for better part of four thousand years, the uh, uh, the Yehudim, which is the real name of uh, of Jews, there was no J in, in Hebrew, so Jew is a corruption. But uh, Yehudim, which means follower of Yah, uh, they have been despised by uh, by most people because. All of the religions of the world have chosen God's chosen people to uh, to uh, to hate and condemn. If you know, if you can, if you can uh, crucify the messenger, uh, it's easier to hide the uh, the message. So, mm-hmm. one of the reasons that Zionism is considered a derogatory term is because it is uh, it is one of the ways uh, people who don't know any better, who are usually ignorant, uh, use. To um, to destroy any conversation that a uh, that a Yehudim or Jew is uh, Craig, is having. Craig, I I did uh, uh, I didn't cut the grass today, and I have like five acres, and I very well could have, but I I did work on a on a website today. Uh, did I break the Sabbath? Uh, what the Sabbath says is that you should not do your ordinary work. If your ordinary work is to be a uh, a radio host, uh, uh, then uh, then. Uh, you could be breaking the Sabbath unless the job that you were doing on the Sabbath was the, the work of, uh, of Yahweh. Uh, for example, what we're doing right now is the work of Yahweh. So uh, you and I and anybody can be about his work any day of the week. But if we are a plumber, we're not to, to plumb on the Sabbath. <laughs> uh, if, uh, if we uh, are a, uh, a lawyer... We're not to practice law on the Sabbath unless by practicing that law what you are doing is in, uh, is a direct benefit mm-hmm. to, uh, to Yahweh's desire to expose lies and witness to the, uh, the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yeshua uh, read scripture in the, uh, the places of assembly on the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath. And as a matter of fact, the day that he was in Sheol, which was uh, a, uh, a Saturday, a Sabbath, was the uh, the day that 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 his sacrifice actually uh, uh, redeemed our souls? Mm-hmm. Um, our souls were not redeemed by uh, his uh, his body's death on the cross, but rather by his soul's suffering and in, uh, in Sheol for our behalf. And of course, he did that on a Sabbath. He did all of his work on a uh, on a Sabbath. Okay. All right, Craig, we've got to go to break here. Just stay with us through the break. Everybody, you're listening to Craig Wynn, and we're talking, well, we're just going around wherever the uh, the conversation goes. You just stay tuned. It's hot, and I'm sure some of you may think you were offended, but you need to wait. Don't don't take that offense just yet. You hear the end of the conversation and where this thing is headed, especially as we get it deep into the subject matter of the seven days of Genesis is in the second hour. My name is Daniel Ott, and welcome back to the Edge Radio Broadcast. My name is Daniel Ott, and I thank everyone so much for uh, joining the show. If you want to continue the conversation live while we're on the air, you can go to the Edge Forum right there off the website. Uh, Craig, welcome back. Thank you. Well, we're going to get to the seven days, but <laughs> I'll tell you, you, one answer, one question to you can take up about the whole broadcast. So I'm going to have to cut you short. Uh, I'm couple. sorry. Uh, yeah, I try to be uh, thorough because what the kind of stuff we're talking about will seem so counter to mm-hmm. what what most people have uh, have been told by politicians, their media, their pastor for for uh, for so long mm-hmm. that j- just to give a uh, a quick answer um, in the light of of the the scale of the deception and the length yeah. of time that we have been deceived with you know doesn't seem like that would yeah. be adequate so yeah. I apologize if I've been a little long-winded on some of these answers uh, yeah you can tell you can tell when I'm getting antsy I'll start saying uh-huh uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> okay <laughs> hey uh, uh listen uh, what about a what about a nurse or policeman doing their job on the Sabbath well uh, a healing uh, is uh, uh, is Something that uh, Yeshua did, so uh, um, healing is uh, is considered appropriate on the Sabbath. Now, understand, uh, being perfect in terms of, uh, of, a, of a perfect adherence to the instructions in the Old Covenant, including each of the Ten Commandments, is is impossible. Man is is unable to do that. So. Uh, our salvation is is not dependent upon us uh, us observing uh, each of those uh, those commandments. However, there is nothing in the new uh, uh, covenant with mm-hmm. Yeshua's uh, sacrifice that abrogated or canceled any of those things. Uh, we're still supposed to follow those instructions. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but the reason we follow the instructions is that they're good for us. What, you know, uh, God made us. He recognized that if we work seven days a week, we become cranky and unproductive. And so he, said, the, he says, the Sabbath is the day that I want uh, to be uh, set apart. I would like you to think about me on the Sabbath, but primarily what I want you to do on the Sabbath yeah. is just don't well, Craig, do your ordinary work. Well, Craig, you, you've not really convinced me that uh, something that's been working for hundreds of years is, is, is sort of all of a sudden wrong. You really haven't convinced me of that, and I know that... Because I thought it's not my job to convince you. It's my job to tell you what Scripture says. Mm-hmm. Scripture says that the Sabbath is the day that we are yeah. to keep set apart. Man says that uh, it is uh, Sunday, unless you live in one of those terrorist countries, uh-huh. one of the 50 Islamic countries, and they say that it is Friday. Yeah. Uh, you have a choice. You can you can believe and trust uh, men, or you can trust uh, God. It's uh, it's your call. We had an interesting comment from one of our previous guests. Uh, it said something to the effect that uh, Moses prayed to the moon god. Do you know anything about that? No, Moses didn't pray to the moon god. <laughs> that's, that's absurd. No, Moses. Uh, uh, now you uh, realize, of course, I've got we got some emails here that said that have said you're absurd. Well, that's uh, I you know. <laughs> People can say whatever they uh, they wish to uh, about me, but uh, the uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, when I uh, I speak about uh, Yahweh, I uh, I only uh, share what he shares in uh, in his scripture. When I speak about Islam, probably know more about Islam than than perhaps any American. So I, I yeah, certainly uh, fundamental Islam, the Islam of uh, of Muhammad and the Islam of the of uh, the scriptures. Yeah. So yeah. I've certainly taken the time to study these things, but I view myself as immaterial. I'm, I'm, my job is to try to expose lies and witness yeah. to the truth, and what you think of me doesn't mean a thing to yeah, me. See, I, I don't know whether I'm, whether I'm absurd or ludicrous. I'm well, so... well, but Moses did not, <laughs> uh, did not pray to the, uh, okay. the moon god. As a matter of fact, there's many places in, uh, in the Torah uh, which Moses is responsible uh, for. I, I think and here's that. another question for you. Okay. Uh, what day did Jesus rise from the dead? I, I, his name was Yeshua, uh, but uh, it would have been. Uh, uh, it appears that the, the timing uh, was uh, what would have been considered the very end of the uh, the Sabbath, because when the women came, they came uh, before the uh, the sun rose, uh, and he had he was already gone. Um, so the. Uh, uh, if he was gone before the sun rose, he would have uh, he would have risen yeah. at the end of the uh, of the Sabbath. The way that he he timed the day, is, the day? this is really it actually is a very important uh, thing here. The way that he timed uh, his sacrifice, time in Sheol and uh, and resurrection, was to copy identically the uh, the first three mikra. Uh, he uh, he hung on the upright pole on Passover. Which was Friday. He went into uh, to Sheol. His soul went into Sheol. His spirit could not. His spirit had to leave him. That's why he says, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His spirit had to go back to uh, to Yahweh because the spirit cannot go into the place of separation, nor can the spirit die. But the soul can, and the soul went into Sheol and did the principal redemption on the Sabbath. The the next day, in terms of uh, of the mikra of Yahweh, is uh, and the, by the way, the Sabbath would have been uh, unleavened bread, where sin is removed from the body. The next is called first fruits, which is uh, uh, and first fruits is is this harvest of uh, of uh, of souls who have been made pure, um, had the sin removed from them. So it's he was he was acting out the first three uh, the mikra uh, Passover. Unleavened bread, first fruits, and then of course the fourth mikra, which is the feast of weeks, which mm-hmm. is come as you are, okay. sinners, uh, Jews, Gentiles. Right. Uh, that's called the feast of weeks. Uh, Fifty days later, um, in uh, in Greek we called it Pentecost. That's okay. when the Spirit uh, fell upon okay. uh, the, uh, the disciples. All right, now, now Craig, I, okay, now I notice you you refer uh, to uh, uh, Yahweh and, and Yeshua. Right, that's uh, what they call themselves. Is is there is there a cult movement out there uh, that has to do with the Yahweh oh, name? Lots of them, of course. So you're not obviously part of a Yahweh cult of any kind, are you? I don't belong to any organization of any kind. I'm not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm anti-religious and I'm non-political. Mm-hmm. So no, I do not belong to any organization. If you don't belong to any organization, you can't belong to a uh, a cult. The fact that that uh, that there are people who are bad. Who happen to know God's name doesn't make God's name bad. 
That's like if there was uh, if uh, if uh, somebody uh, um, uh, who was a rapist uh, knew my son's name and used my son, it does not make my son a rapist. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. the fact that some bad people use Yahweh's name uh, doesn't change the fact that Yahweh has but one name. Yahweh is His name. He revealed His name seven thousand times in the uh, in the Old Covenant Scriptures alone, mm-hmm. and man chose to replace Yahweh's name with Satan's mm-hmm. title. Uh, Lord, which okay. is Baal. Okay. Do you think we're supposed to uh, celebrate the holy days of the Jews? They aren't the holy days of the Jews. Uh, they are the seven mikra of Yahweh. They are his festivals and feasts. He tells us emphatically that these are uh, appointment, appointments that are meetings for us uh, and that we are to keep these meetings for all eternity. And there are seven of them. Uh, they began Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and then uh, uh, 50 days later, Feast of Weeks, which we call Pentecost. Then a very important date that most Christians haven't a clue of, about, which is trumpets, which is called actually Shout for Joy. That's when the rapture will occur. Uh, then uh, you've got uh, uh, the Day of Atonement, which is the day that Yeshua will return. And then you have Tabernacles, which will be the first day of the, uh, of the millennium. All of those days are are essential, and when we don't know them, it makes it very difficult for us to understand Yahweh's uh, message of uh, of uh, salvation. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you obviously are well versed in that. Now, coming up in the second hour, we will be talking about uh, the seven days of Genesis. Why don't you give us a precursor? Can you give us a sure? A look at that? It's, uh, we've got uh, these uh, guys that are saying we should teach intelligent design. There's some that want creationism taught in schools. There's religionists that, that think that science is all wrong. There's scientists that think that religionists are all wrong. The fact of the matter is that Scripture has been precisely right for uh, all of its 4,000 years. Science has become right in the, uh, in the last 40 to 50 years, but unfortunately the people who speak on behalf of Scripture, most of them being uh, indoctrinated in religion, are wrong, and people who speak on behalf of science with their socialist uh, and secular humanist agendas are wrong. But in fact, science as it currently exists and Scripture agree totally. There is zero difference between the two of them. Okay. And we'll so bring... that's a pretty good tease. All right. Very good. Hey, I'll tell you what. Now, here's, here's a question. Might as well just finish, finish our conversation about the Sabbath and the different things you're talking about uh, during this hour. But now, this is the kind of uh, thoughtful question that I, that I do appreciate rather than just calling a, a guest an idiot or a kook or whatever, you know, or unlearned or whatever, as I'm getting here. Uh, here's a question for you. Uh, during my study of the Sabbath in the Old Testament, it appears the Sabbath was based upon lunar cycles, such as it was on the 8th. No. No, 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 no. The Sabbath, seven days of the week have nothing to do with a, uh, a lunar cycle. The things that have to do with the lunar cycle are the seven mikra. And the reason that the seven mikra are based on the lunar cycle is because before uh, man had uh, mechanization, uh, the, the only way for the world to set their clocks was uh, based upon uh, the cycles of the moon. So the, the cycles of the moon were literally established for the, the purpose of being able to, uh, to reckon the start of months and therefore the seven mikra of Yahweh, but the Sabbath is completely independent of moon cycles. Uh, you know, there's 29.5 uh, days in a moon cycle, and there's uh, seven days in a week. They they don't compute. Mm-hmm. Now, see, I could look. I could look. Uh, I could search those scriptures, and I wouldn't come up with either what that question was or what you're saying. So. Oh, it's very that's detailed. Like, I mean, that's that's the thing we're talking about right now is in uh, <laughs> is in Leviticus, but there is there is no tie mm-hmm. between the uh, the uh, uh, the Sabbath and the uh, and the moon. Uh, at all. The, the mikra are often called Sabbaths, but it's a special Sabbath, which means that it's, it's a day of rest. Uh, so regardless of what day, uh, uh, Passover or first fruits, uh, or, or unleavened bread falls on, it is a, uh, a day set apart. Uh, so it's called a special Sabbath. But that's uh, only in the sense of being uh, set apart. Uh, okay. The days of the week uh, have nothing to do with the uh, the cycle of okay. the Okay. All right. All right. In a, in a sentence, do you believe in the uh, Christian Trinity? No. Uh, uh, Yeshua uh, is the human manifestation of Yahweh. The set apart spirit, uh, mistakenly called the uh, the Holy Spirit okay. or the Holy Ghost, uh, is a manifestation of uh, of Yahweh. That manifestation is designed to uh, to do all motherly things. Mm-hmm. She uh, protects us, cleans us, uh, uh, nurtures us, uh, washes us, uh, teaches us, uh, protects us. Uh, 
So you've got one God, his name is Yahweh, for for Yahweh to reveal himself to man in a form that man can understand and relate to, he has chosen two manifestations. One manifestation as, as the Son, that is Yeshua. The other manifestation is, uh, is the Spirit. They are all set apart from the same Yahweh. They are all Yahweh. It's just they're all Yahweh turned way down. Uh, it's like uh, Yeshua said, that the Father is greater, which means that that uh, Yeshua is a diminished version of Yahweh because all of Yahweh will not fit into human form. If, yeah. if all of Yahweh were to become present and, uh, and stand uh, uh, on earth, the earth would be incinerated. Uh, yeah. He has so much energy that the planet itself uh, would, uh, would, <laughs> would melt uh-huh. Uh-huh. In, his, uh, in, his, in his full presence. So for him to relate to man, he had to tone himself down and, uh, and yeah. relate to us in the form we could understand best, which was a human form. Now, now so what? that means Yeshua is literally God. Yeah. But, uh, mm-hmm. but there is no Trinity. That's the reason why there's mm-hmm. nothing uh, discussed uh, in Scripture at all about uh, Trinity. It's a man-made, up, uh, mm-hmm. man-made concept based upon, by the way, the mm-hmm. Babylonian mystery sun god religion. All of the Babylonian and all sun god religions all have a trinity. Now, why would I even try to get you down to one sentence? I, I see that's a, that's a few uh, ever, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> hey, uh, what's the difference between uh, uh, your love for uh, or you know your love for Israel and and uh, that type of Zionism and say the uh, the uh, the Illuminati is there is there an evil group called the Illuminati Zionists? Yeah, the Illuminati was founded by uh, Adam uh, uh, Weishaupt. Are they are they uh, Zionists? Seventeen seventy six. Uh, Adam Weishaupt was not a uh, a uh, Zionist. Uh, uh, Adam Weishaupt was happened to be a Jew, uh, uh, but he was uh, raised by the uh, the Jesuits, uh, and he was he, different times of life. He was either a deist like uh, Thomas Jefferson, which is the idea that there was there there may well be a God, but it, but uh, he doesn't care about and doesn't relate to to, uh, to men. So who mm-hmm. cares if there is one or not? Yeah. And uh, just a pure Satanist. He ended his life as a Satanist, creating a, uh, a special uh, religion. Very easy to learn about Illuminati, by the way. If somebody wants to understand it, there's two great books, both written contemporaneously with the rise of the uh, the Illuminati. The most thorough was written by Abe Burl, who was a Catholic priest. It's called mm-hmm. The History. The Memoirs and History of uh, Jacobinism. Uh, most, that's the most thorough book on the documents of the Illuminati. And, they, mm-hmm. and the quickie uh, version was written by John yeah. Robeson under Proofs of Conspiracy. Mm-hmm. So if you want to know about the Illuminati... Uh, that's the place to uh, to read. If you do that, uh, and then you read a few books on the current practices uh, and morals and dogma uh, of the Freemasonry, mm-hmm. and then you uh, you study uh, the United Nations uh, Council on Foreign Relations, those kind of organizations, you'll see that uh, Scun- uh, Skull and Bones, for example, you'll see that uh-huh. that almost everything um, that Adam Weishaupt taught has been manifest okay. right through. Very, very quickly, uh, somebody wrote in and said, Kenneth Copeland said that Yeshua suffered in hell, uh, and he went there to preach to the captives. Did he suffer? Uh, what Psalm 22 depicts is uh, is the fact that, that uh, Yeshua... Uh, the human manifestation of Yahweh was comprised of, of three elements, the same three elements that, uh, that many humans, but not all humans, have. Uh, he had a physical body. His physical body was nailed to the pole and beaten to a pulp. But okay. his physical body isn't, what, uh, what, uh, is, isn't the full scope of what redeemed us. Mm-hmm. Uh, his spirit... Uh, returned back to uh, to Yahweh uh, on the pole before he breathed his last breath okay. because uh, Yahweh is immortal, the spirit cannot die. Uh, his soul, and Yahweh, uh, it's a, a nephesh. Uh, Yahweh has a nephesh, but his nephesh, his soul, uh, is only right. associated with the Messiah. So for him to take on human form, Yahweh had to have a soul. It is his soul that descended into uh, to Sheol. It's actually the deepest part of Sheol, which is the place of, uh, of separation. So if you want to, my guess is that Kenneth Copeland doesn't have a clue as to what actually happened uh, on the, uh, the pole. Right. Probably doesn't understand that, that, that souls uh, are, uh, are mortal. Okay. Uh, that the spirit is immortal, but souls are right. mortal, and that uh, Yeshua uh, actually had to have a soul, and it's Yeshua's soul, not his spirit, okay. that descended right. into Sheol. Okay, all right, got to go to our 9 o'clock break here. Craig, just stay with us uh, through that period, please. 
Sure. Everybody, you're listening to Craig Wynn right here on the Edge Radio Broadcast. And in the second hour, we're going to be talking about the promise and prophesied seven days of uh, creation in Genesis. And so, and I know we're still getting questions on this first hour. I suppose we can continue. Hey, my name is Daniel Lott. You're listening to the Edge Radio Broadcast. And this uh, interesting interview will be posted tomorrow on our website for free and uh, without commercials, our gift to you. And we'll be back after the break. All right, on our newsmaker line, we have back with us uh, Craig Wynn. Craig, welcome back. Well, thank you. There were, if we're going to exterminate lies, there were two in the, uh, in the news break that uh, are worthy of extermination, by far into the scale. But one was that the president saying that we're going to stay in Iraq until the Iraqis can, uh, can stand up. The fact of the matter is that, uh, that three and a half years ago, I predicted precisely what, was, uh, what would happen in Iraq because it was obvious that we would spill blood and coin, and when we left Iraq, we would lo- leave it worse than we found it, that we would, in fact, empower the Shiites who would unify with uh, uh, Iran, and that the very people who were responsible for 9-11, we would hand over the keys to the world's second largest uh, oil reserves. In fact, spilling our blood and coin to make a situation worse than we found it. The situation in Iraq is we've now had 15,000 Americans uh, either maimed, uh, mutilated, or murdered uh, over these last uh, years, and the ultimate conclusion of that, which is to empower uh, an Islamic government, is going to happen whether we, we only waste 15,000 uh, lives and bodies or we waste twice that number. Uh, the conclusion cannot be affected. We are going to leave that country as an Islamic nation. It's, the Constitution is already an Islamic Constitution. And so to stay there and sacrifice twice as many lives and bodies uh, for a, a failed mission mm-hmm. is, is borders on murder. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot of people on all kinds of uh, sides of the issue are beginning to believe that. because yeah, the, it's, the it's, it's obvious. I've been saying it for now for three and a half years. But the very fact is when you go in and you commit troops based on a lie, which we went into Iraq based on a lie, and you are afraid to say who the enemy is, then... The likelihood is by the time that you leave, you will have empowered that enemy, which is exactly what we've done. We've taken the Shiite clerics and turned over the keys of that uh, kingdom. Yes, Saddam Hussein was a bad dictator, but a bad secular dictator in terms of the security of America is infinitely less risky to America than an Islamic government, particularly one that will be aligned with Tehran because Tehran either already has or soon will have nuclear weapons which they'll use in America. Now, on the opposite side of the coin, the Democrats said that they're uh, celebrating uh, the anniversary of Social Security. If you were just to take the federal budget, uh, the amount of money our government spends, one might be surprised to know that America is already a socialist country. Seventy percent of the money spent by the U.S. government is spent on wealth redistribution. Taking from those who have and giving it to those who have not, uh, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Yeah. Primary socialism is represented with 70% of what the U.S. government does. America is already a socialist nation, which is precisely what the socialists said years and years ago, that America will wake up a socialist nation and not even know how it happened. Mm. Well, now I, th- I think that th- those who disagree with some of the things you said in the last hour, I think they might be shaking and say, well, maybe, maybe you do have some uh, truths there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Craig, I tell you what, let's get into this then, talking about the uh, seven uh, days. Sure of uh, Genesis there. Uh, start us there, and uh, let, let's go forward so you can find out. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, uh, to frame the, uh, the issue, those who think that the, uh, that the earth was created in six uh, earth days uh, and that, uh, that somehow the dinosaurs uh, were around 6,000 uh, years ago uh, and that if the earth was not created in, uh, literally uh, in six days, just 6,000 years ago, that the Bible is untrue, are... Uh, are, are fools. I just, that's the simplest way I can say it. That is an absolutely okay. uh, absurd position because it is clear that the earth is, uh, is uh, millions and probably four billion years, uh, years old uh, and that the universe is probably in the range of 16 billion years, uh, years old. Um, for those who say that, uh, that life has, uh, has arisen 
strictly based on uh, uh, from uh, inorganic material based upon uh, random chance, they are fools as well. And in fact, they may even be the worst kind of fools because it's it's man's arrogance there that uh, that says that uh, that we are nothing more than just the sum total of our uh, of our parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is no research being done in America now on the uh, on the creation of life, if you will, out of inorganic material because scientists have come to recognize that macroevolution, that from inorganic material all the way to uh, to man, is a mathematical impossibility. Absolute mathematical mm-hmm. impossibility. So they, so they have to go somewhere else. And so the so science itself knows that it did not occur that way, although the uh, the proponents of science, the, the socialists, want you to believe it. For example, uh, Darwin was actually a theologian. Darwin wrote twice, in fact, I think it's three times uh, uh, in uh, his groundbreaking uh, work that, uh, that uh, life required a creator, but once life was created, that, uh, uh, that uh, random mutations were capable in natural selection of uh, of uh, of changing uh, individual uh, species, um, but the Huxley, for example, who took that work, uh, edited those parts of the commentary out and uh, and said that uh, evolution proves that there is no God because there is no need for God. Science, as recently as 50 years ago, thought that the Earth always was. Uh, science has not, did not come to the position that the Earth had a beginning, therefore a creation, until Hubble uh, discovered the, uh, the red shift uh, and uh, learned that, uh, that galaxies are moving away from us uh, as evidence that the Earth, uh, not only the Earth, but all of the universe had a beginning. So the idea of creation, which was fundamental to, uh, to Scripture, uh, is now the same position as science, uh, because the scientific position mm-hmm. has uh, changed. Well, you mentioned intelligent design. Uh, you say, is that not a logical conclusion? Of well, uh, clearly, the uh, um, uh, every aspect of what we observe requires intelligent design. For example, should any aspect of the amount of energy at the Big Bang differed by so much as 1 to 10 to the millionth power raised to the millionth power, we could not exist, nor would the universe exist. Uh, so, yes, there was a, uh, an intelligent designer in the sense that the, the specific amount of energy that had to be deployed at the creation of the universe had to be accurate within 10 to the millionth to the millionth power. And even then, uh, uh, the explanation that is given in the first day of, uh, of Scripture, there had to be a period of time where the Spirit of Yahweh had to literally hover over, had to, had to uh, manage the, uh, the result in such a way uh, that, uh, that the laws of physics actually could not apply initially, otherwise uh, antimatter would have, uh, and matter would have uh, set each other, would have consumed one another, and we would not have had a, a universe. Now, when I say that the universe is 6 billion, 16 billion years old, and I say that, uh, that the Genesis account is precisely accurate, uh, here's the reason that I'm in a position to, uh, to say uh, that. All of the Genesis account is from the Creator's perspective at creation. As a fact, at the end of each of his days of creation, he actually uh, gives it backwards from our perspective. He starts with evening and goes to morning. All right. What Einstein discovered uh, in, uh, in his uh, understanding of relativity is that the faster an object moves or the greater the amount of, uh, of mass or energy in proximity to an object, and mass and energy are equivalent, uh, time slows. For example, if, if you and I could ride on a, uh, on a photon or a wave of, uh, of light at that speed, Yesterday, today, and tomorrow would appear as one. Literally, time stops. So we understand and we have proven Einstein's theory of relativity in terms of the nature of time slowing, that a clock on a particle of light or a clock in great proximity of enormous mass moves slower than does a clock in, uh, on, uh, on Earth, which is a you know, greatly diminished mass and greatly diminished speed. So okay. 
we have a means of being able to measure how much mass slash energy existed at the Big Bang. And by the way, Big Bang is a scriptural term. Yahweh uses the term Big Bang uh, in his presentation of, uh, of creation. He also, by the way, uses uh, Mighty Lizard, uh, which would be Dinosaur, also in his, uh, his creation account. Uh, if you want the, the specific uh, Hebrew words for these things uh, uh, for free, your listeners can go to Yada Yahweh, Y-A-D-A, which means to know, Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, dot com, and read the Haya chapter, which is, uh, which is an explanation of all of these things from Scripture. So, from the cosmic background radiation, we know precisely how much mass slash energy existed at the point of the Big Bang. Time is stretched by 10 to the 12th power. Now, if you take 10 to the 12th power, which is, the, which is a, a clock calibrated to creation at the point of creation, and compare that to a clock on Earth, what you would do is take the 16 billion years that, that, uh, that uh, uh, all the evidence indicates that the universe is, uh, is old, Divide that, or multiply that by 365 days, and then divide that by 10 to the 12th, which is the stretching of the wavelength mm-hmm. uh, from uh, measured in the cosmic background radiation at, uh, at the point of creation. Guess what you come to? Uh, three. Six 24-hour uh, days. Okay. <laughs> which means from the point of the creator at creation, which is what the story is being told to us, Creation took, from his perspective, relative to where he was, took precisely six Earth days. Really? Precisely. Which is precisely, well, I can't say precisely because we're, we don't know if the uh, universe is 14 billion years old or 16 billion, but it's somewhere in that period of time. But if you take man's best estimate, and we have two ways to calibrate that of how old the universe is, Using the cosmic background radiation and Einstein's uh, theory, which this part of the theory has been proven to be fact, uh, you find out that uh, from the point of the creator at creation, it took precisely six 24-hour Earth days, which is 16 billion years from our perspective with our clock looking back. But it's better than that. Uh, Yahweh told us that if we wanted to understand the measurements that he was using, we needed to look up at the galaxies. Galaxies, the spiral galaxies, which represent the overwhelming percentage of galaxies, are all based on the thing called a natural E. It's the most reoccurring uh, logarithmic scale in nature. A nautilus shell, for example, is mm-hmm. the most visible sign of the natural E. Right. Natural E basically says uh, that that each ring is is twice the size of the one previous, or moving from the outside in, half the size of the one uh, uh, that it follows. And so if you were to look at creation from the, the way that he tells us to, he tells us if you want to understand the measuring stick for creation, you've also got to apply the natural E. Now, that would also be consistent with Einstein's theory, which says that, that who told, time... Wait a minute. Who, who told us we have to understand the natural E? Uh, Yahweh. He said if oh. you want to understand the measurement, the specific uh-huh. measurement unit that I'm using for creation, I want you to look at the, uh, the galaxies. The, every galaxy of consequence is laid out with what's called, what science now calls the natural E. If you didn't know it is the natural E, all you would you'd need to know is that each ring is, uh, is twice the size of the one that it follows in terms of the, uh, the gap, the distance between the, uh, the rings. Okay. Now, what you want to apply that to creation. You'd recognize that while the creation from the creator's perspective was exactly six 24-hour Earth days, 16 billion years of our time, it was not a straight line progression. In other words, you can't take 16 billion and divide it by uh, six and understand each of the duration of each of those six days from our perspective. You've got to use the natural E, which means that the first day would have been twice as long from our perspective, identical from his, but twice as long from our perspective as the uh, as the second day. So the first day was from our perspective, 8 billion years. So in other words, the creation of the first galaxies and the first stars took place in the first 8 billion years. The creation of our solar system, uh, because our Earth is a second generation star, the fact that our, I mean, our sun is a second generation star, the fact that our Earth has so many heavy metals is, is proof 
that it is a second generation uh, solar system because you only can get the uh, these heavy metals in the depth of a uh, of a very large uh, star. Um, uh, otherwise, you'd only have hydro- uh, hydrogen and, uh, and helium and oxygen uh, in the uh, uh, to build with. So we are a second generation star. Uh, almost every scientific account has our solar system beginning about uh, uh, 8 billion years ago. Uh, Earth is probably, in the form that we know it now, about f- uh, 4 billion years old. Okay, I'll tell you what, we're, tell you what, Craig, we do have to go to break. Let's hold okay. right there. Everybody, you're listening to Craig Wynn, and I told you last week you have to listen hard because he rolls the facts out uh, hot and heavy right here on the Edge radio broadcast. We're going to be right back after the break. And welcome back to the Edge radio broadcast on our newsmaker line. We have with us uh, Craig Wynn. Craig, when you know you you, you messed up a lot, of, you messed up a lot of people's uh, theology and, and things in that first hour. I was wondering, uh, do you apply that similar sort of uh, edge to the the creation story? I mean, wh- what is it? What is it you're bringing to that that is more than say just the time period? Is there something that we don't know about? Well, first, uh, the first thing I did uh, for to appreciate the uh, the creation account is that I translated uh, uh, it directly out of the the Hebrew because when you when you when we rely on English translations, they vary from from bad to terrible, uh, mm-hmm. and it's very very difficult to understand Yahweh's message uh, translated into uh, into an English Bible. Uh, they are they just do a very poor job. Um, so the fir- very first thing I did is I, I went uh, back to the Hebrew and I, I created a translation of, uh, of the Genesis account using what I call amplification. It's a, it's a style that, that the uh, um, uh, Jews used to use a uh, long, long time ago where you, where you recognize that every word uh, 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 in one language can never be translated perfectly into a, a one word from another language that that words have shading and connotation and, and it's important to know those things. So that's the first thing I did. The second thing I did is uh, is recognize uh, because I've got you know uh, two sons that uh, that um, went to uh, to Cambridge to uh, to study under uh, some of uh, of Stephen Hawkins doctoral uh, students and and our our uh, engineers and and um, our particularly adept in uh, in relativity so i studied uh, relativity to come to understand it because if you don't understand relativity you're not in a position to understand time uh, and that's what's uh, being spoken of in in uh, in the genesis account so all i did was apply those two things um, an accurate understanding of time which we know now uh, and an accurate translation of the uh, of the words and so everything i'm sharing with you is based on those two things with the added layer here is that uh, is that uh, although we haven't spoken of it at this point but I think I've got a reasonable grasp of the science uh, biological science uh, evolutionary science um yeah, uh, science of astronomy that sort of thing which okay. you do have to understand otherwise you're not in a position to talk intelligently about how current scientific understanding and the uh, the, the presentation in uh, in Genesis 1 happen to be identical. Well, there, there's quite an argument going out west, I think, particularly in the Can- Kansas school right. system, bringing in the uh, the intelligent design. Is, is that the right way to head no, to the public no, schools? No, because, because, because what they're trying to do is say that uh, that two theories, that was what George Bush said, two, the two theories both need to be taught. There aren't two theories. There, there's only one. Uh, what Yahweh revealed in, uh, in Genesis 1 and what uh, science now understands to be true, not what is printed in our textbooks, our textbooks are are really the product of uh, illuminized minds of uh, of man pretending to be God. But what science knows to be true and what the Scripture says are the same thing. So if you are strictly to uh, to teach the science as it is accurately known, the uh, the Scripture concurs uh, uh, completely uh, with that. Um, so I know I'm 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 not in favor of uh, of uh, of teaching creationism in school not what the uh, the account was designed to do yes it is a miracle uh, just a great miracle uh that uh that uh that we have this treasure that is a 4000 year old mm-hmm. treasure that yeah. is a depiction of the creation of the universe that is precisely accurate that is 4000 uh, years uh, uh Craig, old. Do, you, do you think the uh, original scriptures are the only ones that are, in, are inspired yes that uh that uh, I, that the old uh, covenant 
Mm-hmm. Do, we, uh, do we still books, have? Which the last one of those was written probably 400 uh, BCE. Yeah. Uh, do we still have last. those? Do we still have those scriptures? Well, we do. Um, the the best source of them is the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Masoretic was was badly, um, both badly vocalized, um, uh, creating many mm-hmm. purposeful deceptions. Yeah. Most of that done in the 11th century yeah. through the uh, the 16th century. Well, do you think do you think that the uh, that any translation could be inspired? No, no. That a translation is not inspired. A uh, a translation is the work of men. Uh, we can do our best to translate. I've always uh, wondered about that. Seems kind of, that seems kind of tortured, though, really, to, to say that we have to have the originals and the average person can't. Didn't didn't, didn't God make it to where that the uh, the simple person could uh, absolutely understand? Uh, I would. You, the fact of the matter is that uh, that the scriptural message can be translated into any language that people speak. I uh, to translate it accurately. You've got to uh, to communicate more words within that new language than uh, would have existed in the old language to make certain that you understand the full connotation. You've got to do it accurately. Um, but uh, uh, we all think in whatever our native language is, so okay. no one is capable of uh, of reading something in Paleo Hebrew mm-hmm. and understanding it in Paleo Hebrew. We're all translating it in our minds anyway. The thing that we need to do, though, if we really want to understand what Yahweh said uh, completely and truthfully, then we uh, we cannot rely on our English translation because well, we, they are not complete and, and truthful. Okay, well, the reason I asked you, somebody sent in this, this scripture here. They said in the book of Acts, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch uh, was said he was reading out of the scriptures. Was 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 he, uh, uh, did he have the originals? Oh, it's, it is... Uh, uh, if somebody was uh, was reading out of the uh, of the scriptures uh, during the time that the new covenant was being uh, uh, revealed, uh, that person was reading out of what's called the Tanakh. Uh, Yeshua referred to it as the uh, as the Torah, uh, the prophets, and the uh, and the writings. It's the old covenant. So the only Writings that were considered to be uh, scriptures, and the only term the, uh, that uh, that God ever uses for them is, is the writings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that uh, that would have been the old covenant. Um, there is considerable evidence that um, that John, in particular, uh, was aware and had copies of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he wrote his uh, uh, his uh, eyewitness account. Because it's it's very clear that what he wrote was supplemental to what they they wrote. You know why why uh, write the same thing a fourth time? Mm-hmm. So I think that he clearly had it. Now yeah. we can. Uh, in fact, I've, I've taken a lot of time just to study the history of the uh, the New Covenant uh, scriptures. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you really want to understand what was actually said uh, and written in the in the old uh, the New Covenant, you have to buy a book called uh, uh, um, the. Called the the text of the oldest uh, Greek uh, New Testament manuscripts. It takes the sixty nine manuscripts mm-hmm. that have been found dated prior to Constantine. Yeah, well, when from they... Constantine on, they get corrupted very, very badly. But prior to Constantine, we have found sixty nine manuscripts that cover eighty five percent of the uh, of the New Covenant. And if you want to know what was what was actually said, uh, you've got to uh, to have a copy of those. Mm-hmm. What is the difference between, say, a person who knows all the Hebrew and the the early writings and has access to all this, and a person who just reads their basic version and tries to serve God? Is there a difference between those two oh, people? Oh, yeah, huge, huge. Um, in terms of your ability to understand uh, Yahweh's nature, His uh, plan of redemption. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, his, once, well uh, once you once you understand it more thoroughly than say uh, um, uh, somebody in a church say, and they go on an outreach yeah, somewhere. Night, night and day. For example, you okay. would never use the word church. The yeah. word church is a made-up word. It's a mm-hmm. pagan sun goddess. The name of a pagan sun goddess, uh, daughter of Helios. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the word in in Greek is a very important work. It's ecclesia, and ecclesia means called out assembly. Mm-hmm. Uh, very very important to be a called out assembly. Well, well I guess maybe an cl- organization. Well, if I clarify that, then. Uh, are, are you able to hear from God more than, say, a person who's praying and worshiping and all these other things with their current version yeah, of God? Yeah, well, first of all, you shouldn't be worshiping. Uh, God does not <laughs> want to be worshipped. He wants to have a relationship, and it's all the relationship that he wants has to be in a family. Well, didn't he tell, wait a minute. Didn't he, t- didn't he tell Moses to take the shoes off his feet? 
he did uh, tell Moses to take the shoes off his feet because he was uh, literally in the uh, in the presence of uh, of Yahweh. He didn't want uh, uh, Moses' uh, stinky sandals, I guess, uh, uh, right there. But uh, when Moses fell down uh, uh, before the uh, the burning bush, and when uh, Ezekiel uh, fell down when the uh, the heavens were uh, opened up, the first thing God yeah. says is, hey, "If you want to have a conversation, stand up." Mm-hmm. Well, so when, he does, when he, uh, when, he does not okay. want to be worshipped. In fact, the word that's tra- translated praise in the Old Covenant is actually halal. It means to radiate His light. Okay, when Jesus healed the lepers, uh, two of them fell down and worshipped Him. Did he, did he tell them to stop? No, worshiping? they didn't. That's again the uh, the problem that we have with uh, with our English translation. The word uh, in Greek is not worship. Well, I'm not an expert in so that, so I'm not going to trip you up on it. I'm just so asking that, questions. That's the, uh, that's the problem. It, again, it gets into, uh-huh. like, for example, uh, there is a, uh, uh, there's a passage that talks about every knee shall uh, bow. And it's repeated three times in the New Covenant, so people are aware of the, uh, of the verse that, is, uh, that comes from Isaiah. But they never read the context of it. And in the context of it, the people that are bowing are those who uh, who uh, are being judged, mm-hmm. and the only people that are being judged are those people who are not part of uh, Yahweh's family. So. Yeah, now I, re- I know what you mean about reading in the context, because for years I've always heard you're supposed to tithe, and uh, so once I went back to Malachi to look, because that seems to be the single scripture that's always quoted, and when I got to looking in that scripture in its context, there, there were two ordinances listed there, but they only take the one, which is the tithe. There's, there's another ordinance there that says that you have gone from the ordinances, but the church never talks about that yeah. other one. Yeah, they, well, actually, the, the primary discussion of it is in Leviticus, uh, because the Levites were a uh, were a people who were called to be the uh, the officials in performing the uh, the atonement uh, sacrifices of the mikra, uh, but in uh, in tithing to uh, to them so that they. <coughs> Would have some sustenance because they were they were not included in, in land grants. Uh, you could feed them, um, and uh, but you could not pay them. You couldn't give them a housing allowance. You couldn't pay them. This whole idea of a paid clergy is uh, utter nonsense. And when a pastor says you know you need to tie tithe and uh, and that he uses that tithe for his salary and uh, in his uh, housing allowance. That is completely and totally against uh, the scriptural teaching. Uh, uh, all of uh, Yahweh's messengers uh, had jobs. Um, you know, Paul was a tent maker. They they all had jobs, and uh, uh, and that's mm-hmm. the way that he uh, he wants. Well, yeah. I mean, it seems also that Paul said that he said, "I have a power over you. I could use it and take your money, but I'm not going to." Let that's the... absolutely right. Well, yeah, how come the how come the preachers don't use that verse? Because uh, religion is all about money. Religion oh. is all about money. Every religion is a man made construct. Yahweh despises religion, uh, and if you are <clears throat> the preacher of religion, then uh, you're going to get what's called the greater condemnation. Now, that's, this is one of those things that, uh, to, to give you a great example of what you can learn if you read the, uh, the scriptures in, uh, in Hebrew and Greek and, and understand them in Hebrew and Greek, which, by the way, you don't have to know Hebrew and Greek to be able to do. There's wonderful tools. If you want to buy the best tool, it's made by Logos uh, Software. Uh, but you can buy books that will uh, will do this for you as well. It'll give you every single word. Uh, you can use an interlinear, uh, and you can buy word study guides that uh, that give you word for word and what those words mean. One of the things you will find is that rather than being two choices and two destinations, which is what every Christian, whether Protestant or Catholic pastor, teaches, you either go to heaven and live eternally with God, or you go to hell and you're uh, uh, eternally uh, punished. Mm-hmm. That's absolute nonsense. It's not what the scriptures say. If the scriptures said that, then uh, Yahweh would in fact be Allah. Allah, oh. that is his uh, view of things. He can't mm-hmm. wait to torture people. A God <laughs> who he would is say, torturing people now, it, isn't he? A God, that's right. A God who would say, love me or I'm going to torture you forever, he isn't lovable. And I don't know why most Christians don't just deal with that reality. A God who would say, love me or I will torture you forever is not lovable. He would be sadistic. Well, yeah, but and so would, that's not uh, what Scripture says. Well, wouldn't people say that when you, when you say God would do this or he wouldn't do that, aren't you really making God in your image? I'm, I'm telling you, God has revealed what he is like in his Scripture. What I am telling you is what he revealed in his Scripture. He gave us his Scripture so we might know him. Remember, there's two, there's two God-given rights to know and to choose, one of those rights is to know. If you don't know, you can't choose intelligently. What Scripture says is there are three choices and three destinations. The vast majority of people are going to choose annihilation. It's going to be as if they never lived. At the end of their life, their soul will die, and that's it. 
They aren't tortured That's forever. Depressing. Now, yeah. those who are religious, those who are political, those who are teachers, and they use those positions to deceive popes and presidents, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. many, many pastors, mm -hmm. they're going to get their perpetual condemnation. It's spoken of both in the Old Covenant and again in the New Covenant. Is the that best where, depiction is, of it in the New Covenant happens to be Matthew 23, where uh, Yeshua takes the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes would be the, considered the, uh, the politicians and, the, and the, the liberals. The Pharisees mm -hmm. would be the, mm -hmm. the religious right. And he says of both of them that their teachings deceive, and because their teachings deceive, they are mm -hmm. going to receive the perpetual anguish, yeah. which means that they're going to get the same fate as, uh, as Satan. What, what he says is they're oh. literally born of Satan's spirit, and therefore, because Satan's spirit is eternal, they're going to get the same punishment that Satan gets for, uh, for deceiving people, and they'll be thrown into the abyss, and yeah. forever they're going to suffer emotional, not physical, because they will not be physically present. They're going to suffer emotional anguish for what they have done, but the vast majority of people, probably mm -hmm. 999 right. out of every 1,000, at the end of their life, uh, their, their soul simply dies, and, and that's it. Hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, three, in, three in, choices, three destinations, not, okay. not two. Yeah, and there's somewhere in the, in the old, in the old uh, covenant there it says, uh, Woe unto the pastors that have scattered the sheep. But it's, uh, not only to say it once, it must say it 50 times. Yeah, well, I, tell you uh, what, I wouldn't want a woe against me, so uh, I better make sure. No, you don't want the, the boss to uh, throw a woe against you. And the, in the Old Covenant, he specifically talks about this annihilation as being uh, dissipation. Uh, dissipation mm -hmm. means uh, uh, reduced to nothingness, to become, oh. uh, to become uh, invisible. As if he, he never says were. That when, he, when he recreates, uh, Yahweh is going to recreate the, uh, the heavens and the earth, something he has to do for us because we are going to go mm -hmm. from being three-dimensional to being at least four and probably seven-dimensional constructs. Mm -hmm. And for us to exist in a perfect realm with Yahweh as, as at least a four-dimensional construct, uh, we would be able to move back in time. And if you move back in mm -hmm. human history, you're going to see a lot of pain, and there's no pain in eternity. Well, so, so he has to create a new uh, universe. And he says, when I, when I destroy all the, the, uh, the existing stars, that will be exactly the same thing that's going to happen. That form of dissipation will be exactly the same thing that will happen to the souls of, uh, of men. Well, if, if somebody has uh, had what uh, is conventionally called a born-again experience... Uh, yeah, are, born, are, it's born from above. It's actually not born again. Okay. Well, in, in, in the layman's terms, I'm well, sure Well, actually, the reason it's, it's why he talks about it being born from above rather than yeah. born, from again, uh, yeah. uh, born again, the word doesn't mean again, it means from above, okay. is because you can be born again... Yeah. Of Satan's spirit. Yeah. That's a bad okay. thing. Okay, no, so in the conventional sense, if they, if they went to, say, a revival or something and they've accepted uh, Jesus, they would say Jesus, I'm, you know, they're not going to say Yeshua, I'm pretty yes. sure. But when they do, are, are, are these people heading for the, uh, the multidimensional status, or are they going to be turned into nothingness unless they change their really, ways? Really, uh, really hard to, uh, to tell. We, we, know, we know Yahweh says that, uh, that his family knows his name. And uh, this whole idea of being born from above is being born into his family, being adopted into his eternal family. He says that, uh, that his family knows his name. His, his name is, uh, is Yahweh. If you don't know his name, uh, then, then, then that is a problem. Now, I, I'm not playing God. It's not my job to determine what's going to happen with, you know, in the what-ifs. The only thing I can say for certain is that those people who deceive, who who lead people down the wrong path, they're going to spend their eternity in the abyss with the Satan. Those who are the victim of those who deceive, their soul is going to be annihilated. Those who choose to rely on, uh, on Yeshua's gift and trust Yahweh, coming to know Him, are going to live eternally with Him. I can tell you those things for certain. What happens in the, uh, in the gray areas, not my job. You know, it's not, not yeah. one of the jobs I've been given, so I'm, uh -huh. I'm just, in fact, no human is given that job. So yeah. you, feel like your job is clear, you, you feel like your job is more of like a clarification? My job is to do to, two to, to, to things. Uh, we're, and my job is no different than your job. Um, our jobs uh, as members of Yahweh's family are to expose, to understand, expose, and condemn deceptions. Yeah, I'm, with, I'm with you on that. Political I'm definitely with you on that. You name it. We are called to to understand, expose, and condemn uh, 
uh, all forms of deception, which would be religious deception, political deception, academic deception, you name it. George Bush deception? That is correct. Okay. Uh, and then we are called to witness to the truth. Okay. And so this conversation, we've bounced back all the way back between these two because they are related. It's like we began our conversation talking about the lethal deception of, uh, of this administration mm-hmm. and our media uh, uh, as it relates to fundamental Islam. And the right. fact that millions of Americans are going to die as a result of fundamentalism, the fact that we've been deceived uh, by it, uh, and that we're on the wrong path because of this deception. But the reason we can be deceived is because we don't know the truth. If we knew the truth, we couldn't be deceived. So these things are hand in hand. Knowing the truth makes it much more difficult for people to, mm-hmm. uh, to deceive. So we can't, in general, we don't have the truth in general as it is. Uh, 99.99% of Americans are unaware of what uh, Yahweh is actually like and what so he the reveals. People... They're, they're worshiping on Sunday, mm-hmm. they're, they're celebrating Christmas, they're celebrating Easter, they're calling uh, uh, their Savior by the, uh, the wrong name, they're using Lord, which is Baal's name. We are deeply, be deeply, deeply confused. And being that confused, we can't differentiate Christianity from Islam, and we can't tell uh, right from wrong when it comes mm-hmm. out of the mouths of our politicians. All right, and so we, in, in, in the deception phase, we have no problem uh, sitting down and having a prayer with a, with a Muslim as he prays to his God, and we pray to ours, and everybody prays to theirs. And, That's right. And uh, we call it just getting along. Yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of, uh, of gods that man has, uh, has made. Unfortunately, none of them are real. Um, you always get these letters to the editor to say that the religions are the religion is the base of all all wars. How do you how do you tell that person who who has seen some of the shenanigans going on in the Christian church and the, the Catholic church and these other kinds of things uh, to tell them okay that we're agreeing with you because it sounds like you're agreeing with them who say that re- religious religion is is a bad thing for mankind. Yeah. Well, what it, do you, what well do you, absolutely, religion what do you is give a bad thing for mankind. Okay, but so what do you give back that, to the atheists? Yeah, here's the. Here's the, uh, the, the thing, though, that most people don't understand. There is really no difference between politics and religion. Uh, almost all politicians become powerful based upon religious constructs. The first religion, the Babylonian religion, was, was equally uh, political and equally uh, religious. Uh, mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's uh, 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 explanation of what Nazism was, was equal parts religion and politics, but most people don't know that. Islam, equal parts uh, religion and, uh, and politics. Communism, which was created by Adam Weishaupt uh, through his Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt knew for certain he was creating a new religion. He, he said that he had to create a replacement morality, which we call today political correctness. He had to, to, uh, to teach this new religion and this new morality, otherwise his agenda would not uh, prevail. So religion and politics are, in essence, the same beast. If you look at, at history, prior to the last... Oh, hundred years, religion has been the primary killer of uh, and the cause of wars. In the last hundred years, uh, uh, the religion of man, secular humanism, socialism, communism, has killed more people than all religions uh, uh, that that serve a god, false or otherwise, combined. But communism is the religion of man. It just elevates man to the status of god. It has been infinitely more lethal. So if you're an atheist and you're gloating and saying, yeah, I always knew those religions were, uh, were wrong, don't because the, the, the atheist religion, the religion of man, has been more lethal than, uh, than all other mm-hmm. religions combined. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I noticed that a lot of people have objected to things that you said earlier. And uh, uh, now I know that also in the scripture it says something about if it were po- in the end times if it were possible even a very elect would be deceived. Now I would think that each person, each listener of the religious uh, sort that are listening, um, uh, would think that well they're not the ones deceived. You are, and uh, some of my other guests are, and some other whole religions are, but not them. Wouldn't it by 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 de- definition mean that if it were possible to be elect, that we need to really examine what we believe and how we come to believe it rather than assume that we're the ones who are not. Therefore, would not the truth be something that's so far off what we've conventionally heard uh, that, that we might want to start looking there to see if that's any, if, if any truth lays over there. We yeah. shine light on the deception we're already in. Yeah, absolutely. The, the reality is that, that most people who are listening to us um, are basing their reaction on their opinion. Uh, as opposed to actual evidence. Uh, the, the scriptures as they are revealed uh, condemn 
the practices of both Protestant and uh, and Catholic uh, Christianity. And so, if you wanted to know who's right, your pastor or your opinion, or what I am saying regarding the fact that Christmas and Easter and Sunday worship and and uh, and Jesus and and Christ and all of these things are wrong, and that the right thing is. Passover and unleavened bread and and uh, and uh, first fruits and feast of weeks and and trumpets and tabernacles and and uh, uh, and uh, atonement uh, and the Sabbath and Messiah Yeshua and Yahweh. There is one source. Now, this is what's really interesting about this. If there is a God who is knowable, there is no question that God would have revealed Himself to us. And the, the only form of communication that has any lasting value is written communication. He would have left a written record. If there is no God, then, of course, there would be no written record. But you want to see, is there any credible written record from a being that would live outside the confines of time that could reveal himself to us? There's only one. There's only one credible revelation from a, uh, a supernatural being. That's the Scripture. Mm-hmm. The book that we erroneously call the Bible, but made up of the old and new uh, new covenants. It not only is the only credible source of information about uh, our Creator and about His creation, it literally proves its legitimacy. Some three quarters of uh, Scripture uh, was prophetic when it was written, and the purpose of the prophecy was to demonstrate that the source of the inspiration knew the future before it happened. The only person who can know the future before it happens is a spirit that lives outside of the confines of time. And the only scripture that has detailed prophecies, where the majority of the book happens to be prophecy, is what we call the Bible, the uh, the Old and the New uh, Covenants. And I just did, uh, in Tea with Terrace, the first book I wrote on uh, on Islam, just for fun, I did 20 Messianic prophecies and came to the uh, the realization that by chance fulfillment, uh, it was 1 to 10 to the 56th power. There aren't that many fundamental elements in the entire universe. One of the most interesting is Daniel 9, where uh, 500 years before it happened, Daniel predicted the exact day in uh, late March on our calendar of 33 CE that Yeshua would walk into uh, uh, Jerusalem and be uh, cut off not for himself but for all mankind. Mm-hmm. 500 years in advance, he predicted the precise day that he would walk into Jerusalem. Four days later, of course, he was uh, he was uh, crucified on the on the pole of Golgotha. Um, okay. the, there is no chance that that happened by chance, and so uh, that's that is why okay. I uh, I I have chosen, based upon study, to trust what Yahweh revealed in the Old and New uh, new Covenant. Everything that I have investigated in it, at least as it's revealed in the original languages, is precisely accurate and consistent. Um, and it's the only source of divine uh, revelation that exists uh, in the world. Uh, it proves its, uh, its inspiration. And so the logical thing to do at that point is to trust what it says. And one of the things that it says is that the God who inspired it despises man's sanctifications, man's justifications, man saying, well, you know, okay, so Yahweh had a Sabbath, but, but you know, Sunday works for us. He despises that. Mm-hmm. So, as, as I was saying earlier, when, uh, because I just read an article where somebody said, you know, religion is the cause of all wars, what, so and you're agreeing with them, what would you hand them to them to say, well, you know, uh, I agree with you. Religion is bad, but you right. need something else. You uh, would you tell them you need Yahweh or or you need Yeshua? How how would well, you I would present? Tell them they uh, they need anything. What I would uh, tell them is that is that that uh, it would be wise for them to educate themselves as to what uh, Yahweh revealed in His Scriptures, so they might know the truth that 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 all of man's schemes have failed. Whether it's man creating a political scheme apart from God, elevating man to the status of God, and killing 100 million people in the last uh, 50 to 75 years. Or it is, uh, it is uh, uh, an institution like Catholicism or Islam uh, creating a religion uh, 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 to deceive and to, and to fleece and control people. That both of those are 
wholly and completely failed. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage people to learn the truth. Uh, if you don't want to have to go to all the work, you can go to Yahweh, com. I've got now 700 pages of, uh, of uh, scripture uh, amplified, correctly translated for, uh, for you to investigate and, and, uh, and come to your own conclusions. And then based upon what you learn, make a choice. It seems a shame to me to go through this life and not make a choice and simply have your soul uh, uh, annihilated. Uh, hmm. The Spirit who revealed those scriptures says that, that if you don't make a choice, that's what will happen to you. Yeah. If you make the choice to deceive others, then you know, you'll spend uh, eternity uh, with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you choose uh, Yahweh, he has a very simple plan. Mm-hmm. His plan is that you get to, uh, to be part of his family, you get to inherit everything that is his, you get to live uh, eternally with him, and that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. That does, and it also you also sort of agree with them on the the people who say religions are most of the problem. But they also believe most of the same people say there can't be a literal burning hell because how could a loving God create a literal burning yeah, there hell? Is no, there is no fire so, in hell. So annihilation sounds a lot less painful. Yeah, there is no fire in hell. Fire is used as the metaphor for uh, for judgment. I mean, it's just <laughs> absolutely silly. First of all, uh, in uh, in it's not hell. It's uh, it's Sheol in the uh, in the old covenant becomes uh, Hades and mm. Gehenna. So a, hell, uh, so a hellfire preacher, we, change, right. we all change his name to a, a annihilation preacher. Yeah, that's, that's really the Babylonian <laughs> religion about the uh, that, uh, fires that uh, burn people. Okay. The fact of the matter is that, uh, that fire is the metaphor of, uh, of judgment. It's a metaphor of judgment because it's the crucible upon which, which uh, you know, that, that which is valuable is separated from uh, the, uh, the dross. And so it's just used like the two-edged sword. It's the, the same concept. It's a metaphor mm-hmm. for, uh, for judgment. The lake of fire. It's the uh, the lake mm-hmm. of fire is uh, is the is the passage uh, between uh, uh, Gehenna, which is the South Sheol, the bad part of mm-hmm. Hades, if you will, right. uh, into the uh, the uh, the abyss. Uh, you pass through judgment. That's okay. what the uh, the great white throne judgment is all about. Right. It's revealed okay. in Revelation. It's this this idea that 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 Yahweh is going to hold a uh, a trial okay. to determine which souls that are not. Now, if you've or part of his family, you don't seconds. get judged, but that he's going to determine who gets annihilated and who spends eternity separated from him. And that passage is right. a uh, is a, a lake of fire, if you will. Okay. And Craig, your website is? Oh, uh, for uh, for scriptural truth, yada Yahweh uh, dot com y a d a to know in Hebrew right. Yahweh God's name w uh, or y a h w e h uh, dot com. Pretty soon, I'm going to have a uh, I've got a good friend of mine that's creating a, a site where I'm going to do. Uh, Webcasting and have uh, hundreds of audio files, and uh, it's going to be called Yada News uh, huh. dot com. One of these days, probably in the next month, okay. and it's kind of a clearinghouse for uh, for um, for trying to fulfill the first half of uh, of Yahweh's uh, rights, uh, the right to know. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. There's so few sources, so few people like yourself who are willing to devote a show. Mm-hmm. To uh, to exposing uh, lies and witnessing to the truth, I'm going to try to create a, a site that does it a little bit better than Yada Yahweh currently does. Okay. All right, Craig, can we have you back on the show again sometime? Oh, sure. My okay. pleasure. Oh, well, thanks for coming in on. In fact, uh, I'm happy to take the uh, the criticism. If you've got emails in the, uh, mm-hmm. that you want to store up for the next yeah. time and say, boy, that guy is really crazy because mm-hmm. yeah. I'm uh, I'm happy to deal with those. Okay, okay. We have a number of them. We'll just do that for you. Okay. All right, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. 